Welcome to our home. My name is Dale Partridge and I'm here with my wife, Veronica. Hey guys. Our hope is to help you cultivate a glorious Christian home. Now, this episode is titled The Story of Our Home. Now, if you're new here, each episode that we do is broken into two parts. Uh, Part one is available and free for everyone on every podcast platform. Uh, Part two is only and exclusively available in the ReLearn app. Now, the ReLearn app is a library filled with theological content for the Christian life. So it's from marriage and parenting to church history and eschatology, and you get to gain access to hundreds of audiobooks, ebooks, videos, courses, all for a small monthly fee that supports our ministry here at relearn.org. In addition, every one of my books are also included in both audio and ebook format, as well as uh, new exclusive shows, video series, etc. And so to look at the library, you can just go to relearn.org forward slash app. And to sign up, just click the user icon in the header, and it will redirect you to Uh, download our app, and uh, you can find it in the Apple or Google Play store. So in part one of today's episode, we're going to be sharing the story of our home. And in part two, we're going to be sharing the three greatest lessons that we've learned in our home, lessons about order, hypocrisy, and schedules. So on that note, let's open up with part one. And I'm going to have Veronica open up because I'm going to, we're going to just essentially share our story around how our home and family came to be. And so when you think of our home, babe, uh, let's start with our marriage. How did we meet? How did we meet? Oh man. Well, if you guys have been longtime listeners of the, of, I guess your, our old podcast, this is a separate one, right? Yeah. So of our old podcast, I used to podcast with Dale three, four years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, in our very first episode, we actually shared that. So if you're a longtime listener, you'll already know, but if not, um, technically I met Dale when I was 14 and he was 18, 19, um, because he was dating my sister Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I was just, you know, the tag along little sister, um, that would just hang out with him whenever I could, or my sister would pick me up from school and go to the rock climbing gym and Dale would be there. Um, so that's how we met. I don't necessarily remember the day we met. I no. was, it was so long ago, but um, we do have pictures of us here and there somewhere of, you know, us at my sister's party or things like that. And I'm 14 and or us rock climbing as a and kid. If you don't and clarify, Dale's man. you're, you're going to make me sound like a, like a, Oh yeah. Know. So there was no interest at this time. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that didn't, I said tag along little sister. Um, yeah, no, there was no romantic interest at that time. I was very much just the tag along sister. Yeah. And Dale was dating my sister at the time. And then I'm not a predator. <laughs> and then um, let's see, fast forward when I was 19. I mean, you and my sister had broken up. You know, it wasn't ever anything like super serious. But you guys had broken up. And then when I was 19, we ran into each other um again. And, um, the first words Dale said to me was, wow, Veronica, you're old and hot now. This is true. This is true. That's your pickup line, gentlemen. <laughs> that's what you get to use if you want to find a wife. And yeah, we, we had a, uh, I tried to convince Veronica to go on a date with me for several months mm-hmm. and she would not, nope. um, until I, my persistence continued. Until and he she, bugged me enough where I was like, I just need to say yes. So he'd stop bugging me. <laughs> we went on a date and I had victory and won her heart. And slowly but surely, we went through the steps of uh, dating. And within nine months, we were engaged. It wasn't that slow. But anyway. Uh, Yeah, I mean, we were dating. We started dating February. By November, we were engaged. And we were married the following February. Yeah. So this upcoming February, a month and a half from now, we will be married for 14 years. And together, 15 years. Yep. And so that's kind of the founding of the Partridge home. And we went from there. We had uh, our children. We have four children now, ranging from about, about to be 10 and to be 10 and all the way down to six months old. Mm-hmm. And so we had Aria in 2014. We had um, Honor in 2016, Valor in 2017. 
and then we, we took had a break. We took a long break, and then, <laughs> and then we, we had, just had Deacon. Yeah, this is, or I guess this is going to be coming out in January, probably. So yeah. we had him in twenty twenty three. Yeah, June of twenty Ju- June July July of twenty twenty three. Yeah, July. Sorry, 7th. we have another son whose birthday is in June, and then Deacon is in July. And so uh, that's kind of the story of our children, which we'll kind of reconnect here in a second. Um, one of the founding features of our marriage is. I think Veronica's marriage to me. Um, if you've heard of Jonathan Edwards' wife's book, she didn't write it. It's actually someone else writing it for her, but it's called Marriage to a Difficult Man. <laughs> it's probably similar to being married to me. And so, you know, we <laughs> talked about this last night that, you know, while I was not in ministry when we first got married, it was, you did understand that you were marrying someone that is it was just very intense yeah you were not in ministry when we got married you were in business in the business world um but i knew that marrying you was never going to be a dull moment i knew that marrying you meant that you're yeah intense i guess you could say in a way um go 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 you always had some type of project always something that you were working on that you're passionate about um, so I knew going into it that, that there was always going to be something happening. Amen. So yes, when we got married, I was already an entrepreneur. I had started several businesses already and we met at one of the businesses. Well, we, we re-met at one of the businesses that I started, uh, the rock climbing gym in Riverside, California. Yeah. I guess when we're, when we're first married, you were 24, I was 20 mm-hmm. by that time. And so I was like, you know, fresh out of my parents' house you'd moved out of your parents' house when you were like 17 or 18. So you'd already been on your own and established on your own for a while. You had your own apartment and your own car and ran a business. And I just kind of married into that. Um, It wasn't necessarily like I, like we were starting from scratch. You had already been established and I was coming under your headship. We were Christian. Uh, I, I don't think I was regenerate. I don't think I was born again at the time. We, would call ourselves Christians. Uh, you were, uh, I was born, a Christian. I, a Christian. I became, um, the Lord saved me when I was 18. And so, so not long before we started dating actually. Yeah. And so I, I was, uh, thought I was a Christian and that's a, a story for another episode, but it, actually you can even read my testimony if you wanted to. I think if you go to relearn.org forward slash testimony, or if you just Google Dale Partridge's testimony, you'll be able to read my testimony there on our website. Um, <clears throat> but we did have, uh, at the time we got married, um, 2011, we started, we got married in 2010, 2011, we started a company called Sevenly. And that was a, a whirlwind of an experience because a lot of people don't realize that historically before I was in ministry, I've only been in ministry full time since 2017, but I was a businessman and, uh, you know, I would say a well-known businessman. I had a public platform. I had written several books uh, that were published by Harper Collins. Um, uh, Doing lots of speaking events. Lots of speaking events. Uh, you know, our, like our company was a multi-million dollar company with, you know, f- almost 50 employees and was, yeah, required me to t- talk to investors and deal with different realities that were going on in the company. And we had a headquarters in Orange County. And yeah, we we're in Southern California at that time. And you do, you know, day trips flying up to San Francisco, be back by dinner. (laughs) Yeah. And so we, we did a lot of that. It was was fast paced, but in the business world, fast paced in the business world and a totally different world than we live in now. And so by God's grace, we had a season that we were able to, um, make money. We didn't, we, we weren't as great with our money back then, but we were still able to, we also didn't have children at that time. (laughs) We we were able to, uh, make the Lord by his grace, put us in a situation where we could go into ministry in a financially secure position, which is quite rare. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. we recognize that, that we have, um, we were able to pay off our house, uh, you know, several years ago. I don't know. Um, We were able to, uh, you know, have a a small investment property. Um, You know, we weren't making millions and millions of dollars, but we were making enough money that allowed us to essentially have no debt um, to be in a position where we could serve the Lord and money not really be a motivating factor. Um, I think there's a, I don't know who originally said the quote, but once you get to the top, you realize you're, there's nothing there. And I think that God allowed us to have that sense where we we made enough money. We, we experienced wealth. We 
we understood even a sense of fame and um, notoriety around the business world. And once you get to the top, you realize that there's nothing there. And I think that was really what catapulted us, uh, including the calling to ministry um, into, or I should say out of the business world and into ministry. And so that happened in 2016. There was more of a conflict. We were in another church in Oregon. We moved to Oregon. We had this beautiful home in Oregon. Yeah, we lived um, there for seven years. Lived on a farm. We had like... Didn't think we'd ever leave. Yeah, it was probably like the picturesque, like Instagram life. Mm -hmm. You know, we had the seven acres. Our best friends had the 20 acres next to us. Our other great friends lived in our back house on our property. We had a film studio on our property. We had a gym and a sauna and we had... A, animals. You know, animals and a garden mm -hmm. beds and... And, you know, privacy and overlooking the mountains. And it was just a wonderful situation. It was very, uh, I guess, what is it? Millennial, modern day storybook. Yes. Modern, the modern day storybook of what a lot of people are chasing after. And we're, we're blessed to have that season. We had that season. And um, we went into ministry in 2017. Uh, after really just having a continued... Um, calling from the Lord, but also recognition from people in our lives that I was called to preach or called to teach. I was um, feeling a draw to seminary. I was uh, studying more and more involved in our church at the time. And we went into ministry in 2017. And then all of a sudden, uh, maybe in 2018, I started to get sick. 2019 for sure. Um, and that was a season where it started off with me. It's so many different symptoms mm -hmm. that you don't really know. It probably, I would think maybe started off with like the food stuff where you like have some GI issues after you'd eat and yeah. your stomach would hurt or then you'd have like acid reflux. I had acid reflux for a long time. Yeah. So we had, we had all these symptoms that, that didn't seem to be correlated with one another. So you, it's hard to, determine a diagnosis when you can't put your thumb on what's causing everything. And I was having, you know, dizziness and, you know, air, air hunger and breathing issues and pain in my liver and, um, you know, sleeplessness and twitching, muscle, muscle twitching and all over just the map. Or and uh, body temperature regulation. Body temperature regulation. Mm -hmm. And, and so um, we finally, I got to the point where I was very ill. And this is like a couple year journey, several year journey. It wasn't yeah, we're going just fast like over the story. <laughs> like a couple weeks or months here. <clears throat> this was several year journey. And we, we made the decision to, um, relocate. The cold was hard on me. Uh, we found out eventually that the central culprit for causing my immune system to falter and me being sick was uh, our uh, our house had mold, or 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 I was in mold at some other time, um, but essentially my my mycotoxin levels were off the charts. So I had really high mycotoxin levels. It could have been as simple as like the washing machine had mold in it. Um, basically, my body doesn't detox well, and so you know while I was really sick and my son was sick. Um, Veronica was mostly fine. You know, our other kids were, were okay. Yeah. We had weird little <clears throat> symptoms here and there, but it was never like a huge deal. It was just like, Oh, I don't know. I guess Valor can't have dairy because he has an upset stomach or something, which that, that is true. But there was just like little things like that. And then we didn't realize until after we moved out that these other random symptoms, like I had this like chronic sore throat, I had a sore throat all the time. And I just, uh, you know, attributed it to having Lyme disease and just thinking that was just one of my symptoms. And then we moved out of the house and my sore throat went away. And then now, you know, if I go into a place that I know is moldy, that's like one of the symptoms that'll start to cre creep up is I'll start to get a sore throat again. Yeah. And we didn't even know this stuff really until after we had moved because we were essentially, um, we, we didn't understand any of this until, so we, we don't really know the, 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 where it could have been uh, my office. It could have been 
uh, a place where I was living before. We, we think that I was having mold toxicity issues in the house. When um, we lived in California. When we lived in California. Mm-hmm. Now that we looked back. And so it's really, um, and some people have no well, Yeah, problem. we never got the actual home tested itself. We just got you tested, your body. Yeah. Um, while we were in Texas. Yeah, and, and it's- the, we could just see that you had mycotoxins, but then, you know, it wasn't just necessarily the house that was making you sick. It was in the summertime in central Oregon where we used to live. There's really bad forest fires every year. It's basically like fire season and the air outside is hazardous. And so that would, you know, prevent you from having clean air. And your body was just so sensitive at that time that you weren't able to heal because it was like, and then, you know, you'd be, then the winter would come and you'd be so cold and everything would get inflamed because you're cold. And so you wouldn't be able to heal because of the cold. And so we were trying to figure out ways that we could stay there because we didn't want to necessarily leave Oregon. Um, We loved, we loved our community. We loved our house. Um, But it just kind of became evident that the environment there was not conducive to your healing. healing. Yeah. Um, So I made the decision to move to Arizona and this is kind of a, a backdrop for this whole podcast is that we essentially lost our sense of home for a bit. Um, and I would even say we're still trying to recalibrate that. Now we know home is where your people are. Um, but we moved into a fifth wheel and then we moved into a rental. No, we moved into a fifth wheel and we had to get rid of all of our stuff. Yeah, that was a big thing. We we did we, when you when you when you live on a property for five years, you know that's seven acres, and you have outbuildings on it, and you know your house itself is pretty large on the larger side, and a garage, and you accumulate stuff. It's just it just happens. And once we found out that it was potentially mold, we had we got rid of everything. Yeah. Everything the only things you can keep is basically steel, like metal and glass. And we didn't know what was keepable or not keepable because I was so sick. I was just like, let's just get rid of everything. Oh yeah. Hugh Doe was so sick at that time. He could barely make any decision. So we, we had to get rid of, we just thought, well, you know what, if mold is causing this, let's start our whole new life fresh. And it, I mean, this mean we got, so that means when we moved, we couldn't just like pick a random house to move into because we didn't know if it was going to have mold. So that's why we lived in the fifth wheel. Yeah. We lived in the fifth wheel and then we had to get a new rental, which we paid more for because it was brand new. And you know, new doesn't necessarily mean mold free. So you're constantly looking around. And that's why we also didn't just buy a house that was already existing because of the mold. So there were so so many factors that, you know, we're still even making sense of it all. Um, and we, we've, we've been in rentals, uh, until recently we finally bought a little house. Um, and you know, Lord willing, we will build a house on some land one day again in the future. Uh, we, we, we own some land that we'd like to build on. Um, but we're, we're still in the middle of all those factors. And so it's been a, um, a hard journey to home life for us. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've really wanted to make a consistent place for home for our children, for our schedules, for our, um, sense of consistency um, to it's just stability, yeah, yeah, to just, build a culture and civilization in mm-hmm. in our home for our children that gives them um, structure and traditions and um, vision, and um, so we we've been a bit in survival mode, um, mm-hmm. making things work, and I, I'm still now I'm significantly better. Mm-hmm. but I'm still sick. Um, so I've, yeah, you st- Dale still has issues at some point every day, every day, something that comes up every day. So it's still mm-hmm. very much, our life is very much revolved around that. Yeah. Um, yeah, like so- just how we operate in our house, not necessarily like work. It's just, we're a slave to it, but it, in a way we kind of are, you know, it's a very weird lifestyle because I'll go, you know, if you're following us on, social media on Instagram. I've been recently posting that I've been skateboarding with the kids, you know, so I'll have days where I can go and, and skateboard with the kids at the skate park, um, or go play pickleball and feel totally fine. 
Um, but then, then sometimes you have to stop and come home early because you like start struggling to breathe while you're doing those things. Yep. Or later that night or the next day, you have a really off day because you play pickleball too hard or you skateboard yeah, too hard or something. Yeah, you know, uh, detoxing for some some effect from those activities. So it, it's been truly, our kids have grown up in a home with a sick dad, which is a very unexpected narrative for our home. Um, we didn't expect that. Um, mm -hmm. we've, we've had people that have tried to say like, oh, you should hide those things. You, know, you should have those things, you know, to, to essentially appear to be It's strong. a reality though. Yeah, it's a reality. It's just and something we have to deal with every day. It's and you a, should be able to be yourself in your own home. Well, and I feel like our children have now had a chance to see mom and dad suffer and it doesn't change our faith. Mm -hmm. Our faith perseveres through suffering. It's actually given them um, quite a bit of empathy, I yeah. think, which is, which is a blessing. Um, nat naturally, I, I can struggle with that sometimes. And so it's been a blessing to see how the Lord has grown the, our children in that. So uh, that's kind of the culture of our home currently. We um, have moved into a, a small track home inside of a small neighborhood and in a new town. And we, you know, are still painting walls and we're still buying new decor. And, you know, we, we've had to rebuy everything, beds and couches and tables and plates and dishes and silverware and um, clothing and, you know, wall art, everything in between we have repurchased over the years. And we're trying to think even Differently, we're trying to think long term. We're trying to buy things that aren't cheap. We're trying to buy things that last, that provide a sense of consistency and stability that we haven't had. We're very careful about the health of our home in terms of um, we we watch out for mold. We watch out for um, you know toxins in our house. We don't permit certain chemicals. Our house is like a fragrance free home. Yeah, we don't use any fragrances or anything like that. Um, we have a, what's called a whole house fan, which I think is one of the greatest things. It essentially is a fan that you turn on and it's like a giant, I don't know, like a giant exhaust vacuum fan. <laughs> suction. You, you just turn it on and it, you open up your, house. you open up your windows and it sucks air in from outside. So when you're cooking and there's smoke in the house or when there's. Yeah. For example, that's how sensitive Dale is, is that when I'm cooking, which. I have to do every day. Like we, we cook, we have to eat. Um, the, even the smells from cooking ground beef or sauteing onions or whatever it is, um, can sometimes make him feel sick because yeah. of just how strong they are. Um, so he is a number one fan of the whole house fan. Yeah. And we are, we're trying to even work through some of these things even at our church because, uh, you know, people that like, People wear fragrances, right? It's just a normal part of life. Yeah, colognes, you know, perfumes. Colognes and perfumes whatever. and hairsprays. And and those things really affect me. And if I'm preaching and I'm breathing in a lot of these things, it can make it difficult. And there's actually, I found out there's actually dozens of fragrance-free churches um, across the country. Most of them are liberal, but... Um, but We just happen to have the chronically ill church. We have a lot of people it's not just as like a lot of people in our church are chronically ill. Yeah, we do. Let's and, say at least half. And so we're trying to actually work through and figure out a way to communicate that without making people feel uncomfortable around, um, hey, like, you know, you don't, can you, can you not wear the uh, pound of Aquanet? Um, Aquanet. <laughs> I know we don't wear Aquanet anymore, <laughs> but. Um, That's not even a cologne. That's hairspray. I know, but. <laughs> It's, it's one of those things that is helpful for me. And, but at the same time, you know, we're always going to have visitors and guests and. Yeah. So, I mean, we're in ministry. It's like, yeah. we're going to come across it. So it's not like a, I think we're able to fully avoid, but yeah. if we can help it and we can try and keep those exposures low, we try to. So we're here now in uh, Prescott, Arizona. Um, and we are right on the heels of planting a new church. And we uh, have shifted from a house church model to a traditional church 
after many, many years in the home. Yeah, almost 10 years. And what a blessing it has been. And we mm-hmm. have great families in our congregation. And we have, a, we have a great new building that we've been able to gather in and good elders and good deacons and, and just a, a good community of Christians around us. And we're trying to build home in light of community, in light of relationships with others. And um, what would you say the, you know, the state of our home is right now? Like in terms of what are you thinking about when you think about our home and in light of what do you want it to be? What, what do you think it is now? What is it lacking? Um, and I'm putting Veronica on the spot here, but just. I know. I'm like, oh, I'm you, not what, the greatest the, at being on the spot. I like to have time to think about my responses. Um, keep going. Keep going. Give me more. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, what are you hoping our home culture becomes over the next year or two? I mean, I think my main focus the last few years and just right now, just because you have been so sick and one of our sons has really struggled as well for a couple of years, um, is just a place that's safe for you guys and in the fragrances and the, you know, things that I use to wash our clothes and our dishes and all those things. And, and, um, so there's that, you know, the practical side, but also just like a, a comfortable place for you guys, um, a, a refuge, a place for you guys to be restored and feel comfortable. Um, because you go to the grocery store and I, you know, I have one of my sons with me and 10 minutes in, he'll randomly just start crying. I don't feel good. I don't feel good. And cause he's having a reaction to something in the grocery store. And so um, I don't want you, I, want, I don't want our home to be a place that you guys are reacting to. Um, so I, I think I put a lot of thought into that. I also want it to be something that our kids look back on when they're older and say that they, they just enjoyed being at home. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't a place that they were always trying to escape or leave. Um, the first you know chance they get that home was, a was a, a safe, comfortable place where they can be themselves um, and where we can have conversations that um, grow and edify one another and encourage one another. And um, yeah. Yeah. So we're, you know, we're, we're thinking a home is obviously it's, it's culture, it's emotions, it's aesthetics, it's um, amplifying what is valuable to you. And you know, I'm, I'm focusing obviously on the gospel and uh, building a culture of um, Christianity, of vision, of masculinity in our boys, of, of femininity in our daughter, and um, trying to model to our children righteousness and normalcy according to scripture. And so there's a lot of that that's going on as we create this thing that we call home. And I believe our next episode will be really divulge on the theological implications of what is a home. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about what is a home more than just a building. Um, And, but I I think we'll, we'll kind of wrap up here because I think that's a really good place for us to, um, to end is that you have a little bit of a backstory about our home and where we're at. And we're essentially going to take you on a journey on building a home. And I think it's a lifelong journey and we have not figured it out. Uh, no. I would say, I think we have a very uh, healthy home. I think we are, you know, re- really good at, I'm a pastor. So I, I have the grace of catechizing our kids and in, in, in the scriptures on a regular basis. And those are very easy and normal for us. And, but we are still on a journey and we want to bring you guys along yeah, by journey. no means are we saying we have everything figured out. And by no means are we saying that there's one way to do it. No. Everyone's, you know, that's the beauty in God's creation of humanity is that we're all unique and different and have different strengths and weaknesses. And um, he's designed each one of us differently. And um, everyone's home can still glorify God and honor the Lord while operating in the unique gifts that the Lord has blessed you with. Yeah. Amen. So thank you guys for joining us on this episode of Welcome Home. Uh, To listen to part two of this episode, 
uh, on the three greatest lessons that we learned in our home. You can sign up for the Relearn app at relearn.org forward slash app. Until next time, and may the Lord bless your home, keep your children, and leave you a legacy of righteousness.